Sunday nights are usually more casual at Mises U. They're usually more of uh, an inspirational speech. We've got a fantastic speaker. I'm really thrilled that he agreed to join us. His name's Clifton Duncan. I've just met him in person today. I know him a little bit from online interactions in the past. Uh, he is a classically trained actor and singer. He's appeared off and on Broadway. He actually has a graduate degree from the Graduate School of Acting at NYU. We won't hold that against you tonight, Clifton, but it's a fact, nonetheless. Uh, I first heard of him through our friend Tom Woods, who had seen the, uh, the British play, the, the play that goes wrong, up on Broadway in New York City. And then, of course, this thing called COVID came along and basically wrecked an entire industry. So here to tell us his story and also to spend some time with us is Clifton Duncan. Please welcome him. Jeff with the stand-up routine. <laughs> How about that inflation? <laughs> um, you know, opinions are divided on this. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, great. It costs a lot of money. That's why I got that degree, <clears throat> to speak like this. Uh, but opinions are divided on this kind of a thing. Uh, but some think that it's a good idea when you're beginning public remarks to uh, start off with a joke to kind of break the ice and ingratiate yourselves to, uh, to your audience. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that, but what I will say is that Joe Biden is the greatest president that we've ever seen. <laughs> Be serious, guys. Um, his strong leadership combined with the razor sharp mental acuity, it's truly inspirational. <clears throat> Anyway, it's truly an honor and a privilege uh, to be speaking with you all today. Um, but I have to say, I have to be honest with you, my first uh, reaction when I was invited was, uh, wait a minute, but I'm an actor. You know, what, what on earth could I possibly say to these brilliant young people that would have any sort of value or meaning to them or even sound reasonably intelligent? Fortunately, I was able to reassure myself with another thought which was, wait a minute, I'm an actor. <laughs> Nobody expects me to say anything reasonably intelligent at all. So now with your expectations comfortably low, I have a little story to tell. So my name is Clifton Duncan. Hopefully you remember that from just minutes ago. Uh, my life makes no sense. I'm an army brat, uh, the son of a single mother. I never knew my father. I grew up in Germany, Virginia, Belgium, and Virginia, in that order. And I was actually a very shy and introverted child, if you can believe it. Somewhat of a loner who took a keen interest in solitary activities like drawing and illustration, but uh, who also dabbled in music, poetry, and fiction writing. In my senior year of high school, I dropped out of my French class, much to the chagrin of my teacher, to chase a girl into drama class. Pretty much the reason most straight guys end up doing theater anyway. <laughs> it's true. There, <clears throat> I discovered an aptitude for performing, and I soon wound up playing a pivotal but supporting uh, role in our school's uh, production of the musical Bye Bye Birdie. Should have been the lead. Whatever, it's fine. Um, I'm not bitter at all. Anyway, uh, friends and family alike were astounded that this uh, seemingly shy kid seemingly had no fear of appearing in front of an audience and subsequently stealing the tragically few scenes that he was in. <laughs> now, later on, this shy, directionless young man would go on to, t to earn an MFA from New York University's prestigious graduate acting program. It's also very expensive. It's a uh, <laughs> subsidiary of the Tisch School of the Arts, one of the world's most elite conservatory programs for young actors. Um, it's considered on par with or often superior to America's other elite institutions, those being the Juilliard and the Yale School of Drama. Yale's okay. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of how competitive this institution is, at that time they would audition uh, a thousand young hopefuls from around the country, sometimes around the world. And out of that thousand, they would call back 50. Out of that 50, they ultimately offered spots to 18. Now, many of my classmates had to audition multiple times to get into the program. I got in on my very first try. I graduated in 2009, right in the midst of what was then called the Great Recession. I thought it was kind of mediocre. I didn't enjoy it that much. 
Um, over the next decade, I essentially lived out of a suitcase and some boxes, subletting tiny rooms and shoebox apartments all over the wonderfully pristine city of, Man uh, city of Manhattan, well, island of Manhattan. And I graduated from supporting to lead roles at many of America's top theaters. And eventually, after a bunch of near misses, I finally landed on Broadway in the hit comedy, The Play That Goes Wrong, which Tom Woods is very, very, very obsessed with and probably knows far more about the show than I do. <laughs> and I was in it. So soon thereafter, I found myself working with renowned directors and starring opposite Tony-winning actors and actresses and doing television with guys like Jimmy Smits and a personal favorite of mine, Scott Bakula, who was awesome in Quantum Leap. And I was earning praise and effusion from legends such as Joel Gray and the late Stephen Sondheim and even garnering award recognition for my work. After hearing me sing, there was one, um, one actress who quipped to me, uh, incredulous. She goes, why on earth are you not famous? Are you an asshole or something? <laughs> maybe, Nancy, maybe. Now, I don't say all of that to brag, I really don't. I, it may come as a surprise to many of you, but in many ways, I am still that uh, shy boy that I referenced earlier, who, uh, though comfortable in the spotlight, um, I don't like to draw too much attention to myself, oddly enough. Um, I don't actually talk that much about my acting career. I never did. And uh, it's, it's hard to do so without feeling like I'm bragging, and I find bragging uh, highly distasteful. I once had a teacher tell me I could use some more arrogance, as a matter of fact. But the thing is, on a deeper level, I am bringing up these achievements. Um, to do so is actually a source of great pain and resentment for me right now. Um, because it reminds me of a life that I've spent the past two years trying desperately to forget. I've been trying to forget it because the contrast between what my life was and what it is now, to be completely candid, uh, often drives me to despair. So now I'm staring down the barrel of uh, 40 years of age. I no longer reside in the city formerly known as New York, a place I called home for a decade and a half. I wait tables for a living, something I hadn't had to do since I was 22 years old. I no longer have a powerful manager sending me auditions for lucrative, high-profile, life-changing projects, and I no longer have the prospect of earning a five-figure weekly salary working in TV or on Broadway. And so now the prospect of paying off all those NYU loans, uh, maybe even starting a family, have become even more distant dreams. I'm now shut out of the entertainment industry. I have few marketable skills because I never needed them. The few skills I did work on centered around acting and singing skills, which are highly valued in New York and Los Angeles, but which, as you might imagine, have very little value outside of the arts and entertainment sector. I feel as though I'm starting over from scratch and must learn things that most adults my age, many of whom have families and other weighty responsibilities, have mastered. And so you may be asking yourself, well, what the hell happened? Why have I gone from having a billboard with my likeness on it in the middle of Times Square, winning standout notices in the New York Times and guest starring on network television to where I am now? Well, it's quite simple. I refuse to allow any employer, or by extension the government, to act as my health care provider and to dictate what I inject into my body. I refuse to be bullied or coerced or shamed into taking a medical product that I neither want nor need. I've been extraordinarily vocal in my opposition to what I view as grotesque and egregious state overreach into private affairs and personal freedoms. Indeed, even if things were to magically return to normal tomorrow, I'm greatly disturbed by the precedent which has been set, wherein government officials and bureaucrats can take it upon themselves to determine who is essential and who is not to decide who gets to operate their business and who does not, and in some cases decide who's allowed to travel and who is not. I mean, we're still winning tennis tournaments, so, you know, what are you going to do about that? Now, part of the mission of the Mises Institute is to promote individual freedom. As an actor, I was trained to be a conduit and a vessel for both the splendor and the tragedy of the human condition. And as such, I'm also a staunch advocate for the freedom of expression and a firm believer in and champion of the irrepressible fire and vitality of the human spirit. As an artist, while I can appreciate form and structure, I also value nonconformity, especially when it challenges an increasingly square and constrictive status quo. And so, 
Although I've paid a price, I'll never regret standing up to, and forcefully saying no to a repressive, nonsensical, unethical, and ultimately unnecessary encroachment on our freedoms. I'll always enjoy denouncing short-sighted, inept, or corrupt elites. I don't really call them elites, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll refrain from calling them what I normally do, which is garbage people. Um, their arrogance has deluded them into thinking their credentials or their position qualify them to dictate to me what is for my own good, as if they know and care for me better than I could know and care for myself. I mean, honestly, I don't want to throw any stones, but uh, does anyone in here look at, I don't know, <laughs> like Michelle Walensky, and it's just like, now that lady knows what she's talking about. Um, I don't. Um, you know, I'm not going to lecture you on the importance of things like telling the truth and standing for your principles. Sorry, Jeff. That was sort of uh, the agreement. Um, but the, uh, the fact that all of you are here right now signals to me that you also share those values. I mean, it's not like I have any great insight into economic or social theory. I'm at the beginning of my intellectual journey in that regard. But what I can offer you is a little encouragement and some optimism. Now, it's uh, no great secret that things in the world don't seem to be going so great right now, with forecasts of difficult, austere times ahead, or even worse. Such uh, predictions are rampant. The past two years have demonstrated that with the, the frightening ease with which masses of people can be manipulated, either driven to destructive protests or terrified into compliance with nonsensical and deleterious rules and policies. They've also shown us the dangers in giving a small pseudo-clergy, both elected and unelected, the ability to exercise influence and control over our lives and our livelihoods. Supply chain disruptions, warnings of bad harvests and food shortages and mass starvation, concerns about conflict overseas, worries about what seems to be an ever-deteriorating social and political fabric here in the United States. But I do have some good news. I'm a pot-smoking, pro-choice atheist. That's not the good news, I promise. Don't do drugs. <laughs> don't do drugs, guys. Just don't do it. Um, I like battle rap, Broadway, Shakespeare, and Judy Garland. The point is, there's really no reason I feel like I should be here right now, and yet, here I am. Given my background, there is very little reason why someone like myself should ever come into contact with someone like Mr. Jeff Deist, and yet I have. In fact, over the past two years, I've developed relationships with all kinds of fascinating people from across the socio-political spectrum, across various professions, and across the world. And while I mourn the loss of many friends and former colleagues and grieve what at least for now appears to be the end of an exciting and cherished career, I've now found a new venture as I explore this whole content creator and influencer thing. I mean, there's a guy in, uh, in Germany, a university teacher, who wrote to me, and he told me that he uses my podcast as a part of his syllabus, or syllabi, I think that's the word, um, and that his students actually ask him if they've seen the latest episodes, which is pretty awesome. I mean, I was, I was born in Germany, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool that somebody out there is uh, showing some love and, uh, you know, and sharing my stuff with others. And uh, simply put, once I began saying what I really think, my reach quickly exploded far beyond what I'd achieved chasing a career as an actor. And I found new relationships with some truly incredible and interesting people. And so here's the good news. The good news is that we are all seeing and discussing the same problems and issues. Scientists, economists, scholars, writers, journalists, gamers, comic, uh, comic book enthusiasts, truckers, farmers around the world, people from all walks of life are seeing the same things and rebelling against, rebelling against the same things. And now, while you are just entering the prime of your lives, you're living through a major paradigm shift in which humanity across the globe has awakened to the importance of preserving independence, to the importance of standing up to would-be despotism, the need for robust and lively debate and wide-ranging discussion. I believe that that awareness and that desire is growing. Additionally, selfishly speaking, what I've discovered is that there is a massive appetite for beauty and for meaning and transcendence, a thirst for the awe and the wonder that great works of art can generate. And I've discovered that, believe it or not, the people of New York and Los Angeles, in fact, do not have a monopoly on sophistication and culture. More people than ever now have access to and can stake their claim in the vaunted marketplace of ideas that we hear so much about. More people than ever are discovering with the help of technology the works of great thinkers like Hayek and Mises as I have done. 
More people than ever can and are speaking up against corruption and shining a light on areas that those in power would rather conceal. And we're living at a time where it appears that people are discovering the, the folly and overly centralized power and that perhaps those who've anointed themselves as our betters, the garbage people, excuse me, um, the experts, uh, let's say, are far from infallible to be diplomatic about it. Despite what the so-called artists and hip, urban, exorbitantly expensive metros might believe, it's people like us who are pushing back against and forging a new status quo. It's people like you who are challenging the regime and helping to keep the rest of us honest. And I believe it will be people like you, with your intuition and your innovation, who will ultimately win out over the Covidians and the critical theorists and the climate catastrophists. It's you who choosing to color outside of the ideological lines prescribed to you who are the future. So I suppose, in short, that I wish to impress upon, impress upon you that the idea that all is not doom and gloom. And I encourage you to push back against the cynicism and the nihilism of the age. You may suffer consequences in the short term, but I'm an example that over time, things kind of tend to work themselves out you never know what kind of company you'll be keeping. And I must say that uh, as someone who uh, was an actor for over 20 years, I've never been more, uh, more appreciative and uh, admiring of my audience. So thanks for listening, uh, listening to me run my mouth. End of speech, turn page. <laughs> Clifton agreed to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so I know we have a mic, or do we have, we have just, just the one mic, but, so let me ask an opening question. Can you just tell us what's the current state of Broadway, both for the actors themselves and for audiences attending? I don't know what the COVID status is of Broadway. Well, it's funny, I, I actually, not to do a shameless self-plug, but my latest podcast right now is about, it's the thumbnail says, how COVIDians are killing Broadway. Um, so it's not just that the, you have to have gotten the, man, the, the, the vaccine and boosted in some instances um, in order to work um, as an actor. Um, there's also a cultural kind of shift that's happened. Um, I think people really understand that the, the, the shots are not the sort of silver bullet uh, that they were uh, paint, made out to be. Um, you still have shows closing either early or going on hiatus on Broadway. Off-Broadway is really, really struggling right now. Um, there are some institutions, like the Lincoln Center, for instance, um, that are requiring audiences to be boosted still. Meanwhile, in Atlanta, Georgia, I mean, you know, you can go get a lap dance at Magic City. And you've been able to do so for like a year, while you can't, but you can't go to see a Broadway play. So it's, um, I, I, my big problem is that nobody really says anything. You know, like people can see what's going on. And what's even more egregious about it is that uh, as actors, unless you're super, super famous, you really have no leverage. Um, because there's always somebody there to take your place. There's, for every person, there's like 100 people behind them that are, you know, and it's even practical things, like not just wanting money, but, you know, you need insurance weeks, like many other professions. Uh, your, how many weeks you work as an actor uh, in, uh, determines how much insurance you get. So there's all kinds of practical factors that go into why people are deciding to um, either lie or go ahead and get the shots. Uh, so um, there's economic turmoil. Um, they're trying to convince themselves that things are going well, um, but it's not. I think something is broken. I think people realize it, but people are afraid to say it. And I have a friend who I'm kind of on the outs with because, um, you know, she's still kind of in the machine, and, you know, she got uh, the Johnson & Johnson, I think. Um, but she said, well, I don't want to, I didn't want to commit career suicide. I'm like, well, that's, that's the problem. It's people like you who are just, who are allowing this regime to continue even though everyone knows or has some inkling that it's just, it's wrong and it's not working. So that's the long-winded way of saying that um, uh, it's effed up. Um, I don't know if it's going to be repaired anytime soon, but that's the state, uh, state of things as I, as I see it. All right. Uh, um, oh. All right. Uh, well, thank you for your great speech. And my question is fairly simple, to be honest. Why do you think the people in Hollywood and in Broadway, I 
are promoted that kind of cultural obedience to the government and to big corporations? I've been trying, excuse me. So the question was, um, was it why are woke, why is the industry and Broadway specifically, as bad as, as, bad as, as bad as it is in Hollywood, it's like 10 times more concentrated in the theater, um, why they're sort of supporting these big corporations now in terms of like, like pharmaceutical industries? Um, well, one, my guest tonight is a, this dancer named uh, Pamela Goodman, um, who said something that really shocked me. She said, well, you think about commercials, right? Um, you get the initial payment uh, for, doing, for shooting the commercial. Your agents get a commission off of uh, when you work. And so if you turn on TV, what do you see all the time? It's pharmaceutical ads. So you have these agents, these actors and agents who are making all of this money off of these pharmaceutical ads and uh, pushing these uh, shots. And the agents are getting commissions on it uh, as well. So if we talk about incentives, see, I know a thing or two. Incentives and how people respond to them. Well, you're incentivizing this sort of behavior. And uh, so you don't have these uh, representatives who are going to go out of their way to say, well, my client you know, needs an, an exemption. Um, another thing is that um, the industry tends to really attract people who are strictly, this may be a shocker to you, but they're anti-capitalist. Um, yet at the same time, um, they, they're deeply, deeply feeling people, right? There's a reason they call them bleeding heart uh, liberals. They, and they have this idea of themselves as citizens of the world, as very open, very compassionate. So when they've been convinced over the last couple of years, because you know, they get their news from Jimmy Kimmel and Stephen Colbert, that uh, they are you know, on the side of good, no matter what the cause is. It can be a cause completely diametrically opposed to what it was a week before. But they'll go along with it. A, partly because it makes themselves feel better. They, um, they get social points for them, for, for, from their friends. Um, but also, it's a very reputational uh, industry that's built on relationships, and nobody wants to say the wrong thing. Nobody wants to rock the boat. Um, I mean, I've had phone calls from directors saying, you know, I want to work with this actor, but uh, how is it like that? You know, so you, people talk, and it's about who you know, uh, just as much as, about, uh, as it is about your talent. So there's a lot of factors that go into why people are kind of pushing this thing now, even though uh, from the outside we can see that it's completely nonsensical and ridiculous. Hi, thanks for the talk. So my question is, I wonder if you had the same passion that you have now towards liberty, if you were liberty-oriented pre-COVID, and if you had the similar outlook on life. And if not, then what was the catalyst? What was the moment that made you become aware of how crucial this is? Um, that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, I was always kind of, Easy going, you know. I never really uh, thought that much about things, but I will say, um, I've been thinking about this. Back in, so in August of 2009, while uh, Barack Obama was publicly stumping for whatever single payer, whatever it was, like you know, government health care, um, there was an article buried deep in the New York Times in their A section about how he was meeting secretly behind closed doors with these pharmaceutical or maybe insurance companies. I forgot. It was such a long time ago. Insurance companies? Well, he knows. And um, so I'm like, well, they're sort of helping craft this bill, you know, but, but the, the term government mandate, immediately I said, I don't want it. And so I wonder if constitutionally, that's just sort of how I'm built. I'm all, I mean, I've always been kind of hard-headed, always kind of a loner in, in many ways. Um, and I've always had this streak of like, don't tell me what to do. And, uh, and even, and my skepticism of, say, government uh, was, created by uh, ironically listening to like left-wing journalists like Glenn Greenwald, who was consistent in his criticisms of the Bush administration and the Obama administration in terms of how they reacted to the war on terror, or 9-11, I should say. So this idea of a creeping surveillance state and of government overreach, they've always kind of been in the back of my mind as things to look out for. But um, I would say that um, during COVID, what really, really disturbed me in my capacity as you know, one of these sensitive feeling artists was that um, everything that we're asking people to do to save lives seems to fly right in the face of anything that resembles being remotely human. And um, I, I said, this is not right. And I couldn't believe on top of that, that you had all these people in one of the, arts, the, the cultural art centers of the universe allowing themselves to be rendered as less essential than like liquor store operators. It was very strange to me. Um, so, 
but uh, like, again, you know, people just, they don't want to say anything and they don't want to speak out. And I just said, <laughs> I'm tired of doing it. Like someone has to say something and no one's doing it. And, um, you know, I don't know. I, I just, maybe I'm just sort of built like that. Some people are built different, as they say. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry. I kind of ranted there for a little bit. Yeah. All righty. Hello there. So Hi. when word went out that you weren't taking the vaccine, like socially, what were the effects? Like, were you brought in to do like struggle sessions or things like this or have to explain yourself? Or was it more that people just simply stopped talking to you? Were you interrogated on your other views or like, were you known as being, as you say, like uh, 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 a pro-choice atheist or, and people, did people take that as given or did this like, you know, you must've been a reactionary the whole time. How did that go? Well, my manager sent me, um, you know, I mean, I don't have any hard feelings against her, but she sent me this email, which is basically like, you know, I, I can't submit you for anything. <laughs> and so then, uh, like I said, you know, if you're not working, they're not getting paid. And so eventually I was just a very little use, uh, use to her. Um, I got into it with some people, you know, on Twitter, which is always a great place for a nuanced discussion and debate. <laughs> Um, like there was an actor named uh, Stephen Pasquale who's very uh, successful in the, the New York sector um, sphere. And, um, you know, he made this tweet about how uh, people who are unvaccinated, should, should, their lives should be made harder and all these kinds of things. And I just said, you know, you know I worked with this. I defended him you know, on several occasions. You know, he's not the easiest person to get along with or to work with, but I never had any problems with him. And I was just like, well, you know, Stephen, <laughs> um, you're talking about... Now, mind you, this is an industry now which, is, which has gone full-on anti-racist, right? And I'm sure people in here are appraised of the statistics about the, you know, vaccine uptake disparities in various communities and demographics, right? So I was like, okay, well, you're, you're advocating for a majority of people who look like myself at a time in the industry where we're trying, where we're <laughs> diversity hiring like mad, and um, you're making life disproportionately difficult for these groups of people. Is this what you want? Is this, is this the kind of society or industry that you want. And he just shot back with this stupid, you know, well, if you're looking at the data, people who want to end the, the pandemic, da, da, da. I'm like, if you're looking at the data, you would understand, you know, age stratification, you would understand who's most at risk, you would understand comorbidities, you, you would understand all these things that you clearly don't know anything about, but you're speaking about with such confidence. And so I would see all these people that I used to work with who were just, you know, the, 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 this, this Broadway show closed early. Oh, if only more people have worn masks. Oh, it wasn't the third shot. It should have been, they should have got seven. You know, there's, there's this complete monoculture and groupthink that, um, that's uh, almost impenetrable. And if you say something about it, then you either get clapped back on social media, which is the worst thing in the world. People treat it as if it's the worst thing in the world to have people say mean things about you on Twitter. Meanwhile, people are getting shot in the subway in New York, you know what I mean? Um, but that's what it is. So it's, it's this weird culture of conformity and people will just, it doesn't matter what you ever did, you know, before that, they'll, they'll question you. And thankfully I have some cool people who are like, all right, I understand it, but you know, the industry needs you, man. You're like, you know, you need to be able to share your gifts. I'm like, okay, that's cool, but I'm not gonna be coerced into taking something I don't need and that I don't trust. And that, I mean, I already got the disease, you know? And if I were to book a movie where they were like, hey, you gotta go travel over here and get the yellow fever vaccine, I would, I would get it, because I don't want yellow fever, but I already had COVID, but no one seems to really care about any of that. So. I don't know, I'm, I'm, my schadenfreude is sort of high right now. I'm like, you know, I hope not anything bad happens, but at some point, something, the dam has to break. They have to see something that something is wrong. But again, long-winded, but I hope that answers sort of your question in a way. One of the things we talk about is kind of the need to build new institutions to give, you know, to, to kind of break away from a lot of the, the tyranny of the past. Do you see any opportunities where, you know, is, is the future of Broadway, Orlando, right? Is, is, is there the opportunity for development within the arts in a way that we've seen in, in some other industries of breaking away and perhaps trying to cultivate talent and culture in freer states. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting time right now. Um, I'm slowly collecting people um, who are in the industry. I was just telling um, some new friends of mine that you know, there are people that uh, I went to conservatory with who have the same sort of aesthetic and standard and training that I do. And we're all seeing the same things and saying this is not right. So. You have um, people, for instance, who are you know, in the comic book industry right now who are really doing their own, launching their own lines, which is really amazing to see. Um, musicians have been doing this for a long time. So now the difficult part is to get um, more artists and filmmakers and, and playwrights and actors and directors and so forth to come together 
And um, I mean, my dream is to try to broadcast just great work to people across the nation so that um, theater can become more of a cultural, um, a popular cultural American institution like it was like back in the 50s. Um, and I think with the technology that we have, uh, we can do that today. And also, there's people around the world now, there's these systems in place where people can say, you know, well, I'm on Social Security, but I like what you do, so I'll give you this two bucks and I'll contribute to what you do. Or, you know, I'm, I'm a truck driver, I don't have that much money, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a broke high school kid or something, but I'll give you like five bucks to, um, you know, for your, to help put on your concert and pay your musicians and stuff like that. So it takes a lot of organization, which a lot of artists just don't have, unfortunately. But uh, slowly we're coming together and figuring it out. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, decentralization and parallel societies. And I think, um, you know, people are reacting uh, really positively. So the, again, more good news, more good news for all of you. Yeah. yeah. Firstly, I admired the honesty uh, and radical transparency in your speech. I listened to one of your recent podcasts in which you were discussing uh, contemporary stereotypes about libertarians. In your opinion, what is the most annoying uh, contemporary stereotype about libertarians? You know, I, it's it's hard for me to answer that question because I, you know, I feel bad because uh, like when I had when I had Jeff on the show, I was just like. So, so sometimes you do these, these talkbacks as actors where people ask stuff like, how do you learn all those lines? And you're just like, oh, okay, this is like, like the most basic you know, shit ever. But, um, sorry for my language. But uh, so I had to ask Jeff, like, what, you know, can you explain sort of the, the libertarian ethos, you know? And uh, so it's, it's tough for me to answer that question, to be honest, because uh, I, I, I don't know enough about libertarians, libertarianism, to, to have formulated a stereotype in my mind. Um, I will say that, uh, I mean, you know, there's guys like Tom Woods, you know, who was like, you know, I've seen you and I, I, I saw that. I saw you in that show. I saw it a million times. And I think it was just, you know, it's this and da 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 And so, so there's, there's no kind of, there's no stereo. I just, I've never done that before, by the way. This is the first time. Um, so, but it, it, so there's no, it doesn't really, there's no stereotype for me, and I keep meeting people who break whatever stereotype there might be, you know? I mean, I'm looking around this room at you people right now, there's no sort of conformity or like, I mean, we're all kind of dorks, you know? But, <laughs> it, but there's no sort of, I don't see any sort of sing, singular trait about any of you, which is a, a great thing to see. It's almost like um, real diversity, who knows? I mean, within this sphere, but you know what I mean. So, sorry, I can't answer your question. So uh, first of all, your Tom Woods impression was spot on, and you should totally play him in a, in a movie or something. So uh, how important is it for um, actors and celebrities to come out in the for the cause of liberty as opposed to just like uh, nerdy academics like us? Um, I don't know if it's that important because we're not the smartest people, to be honest with you. Um, what, what I... What I want is a world where an actor can come out, you know, and, and say, an actor can say, like, I spoke at the Mises Institute, and I did a podcast with Douglas Murray and Jeff Deist, and not have people say that I'm some kind of Nazi. Um, and I do think it is, I mean, so there's, a, there's actually a group, I'm not gonna name who they are, but it's like, it's a more conservative leaning, leaning actors group. It was started by uh, Gary Sinise. And um, it's kind of like Fight Club, you can't talk about it, it's like invite only. And they, they take their secrecy and anonymity very, very seriously. And you're not supposed to like talk about it at all. And because nobody wants to lose work. And again, it annoys me because I'm like, guys, this is part of the problem where you have these actors and, you know, you, I, I could name people that, I'm like, it's obvious that you don't, you're not on this, this whole, like, woke train. But they don't, they kind of stay out of it. And I know they're staying out of it out of, for self-preservation. And um, so, it, I mean, it is important just in terms of breaking, you know, sort of jamming the culture and breaking it up and saying, you know, look, there's, there's more of us here. And I think what it also does, what it would also do, so yeah, I guess it is important because then you have, more and more people who will be drawn to what it is and what we do. And, you know, we're not just sort of these, these freaky show ponies with these ridiculous opinions um, who are just saying things that we, you know, I mean, I love Mark Ruffalo, but if you tweet all this crap about 
about capitalism. I'm like, we don't know, we wouldn't know who you are if it weren't for capitalism, you know what I mean? And um, so my hope is that more people would speak up just to say like, look, we're, we're more like you because our job ultimately is to serve you. You know, you're our audience, you're you are our ticket buyers, our customers, and uh, it's my job to deliver um, like uh, indelible, just compelling experiences that you won't forget. That's the whole point of what we do. You know, that's, that's, that's the service that we provide to you. And when you have people who continually say like, you know, more than half the country is a bunch of, again, racist Nazis, um, that really doesn't ingratiate people. You know, I see people all the time who are checking out. They're saying, you know, I don't go to movies anymore. I don't, you know, play, I don't read comics anymore. I don't do this, I don't do that. And I said, no, that's not, we're, we're moving people further and further away from each other when really one of, the, one of the magic things about what we do is that a bunch of people can come in into a dark room who don't know each other and have this communal experience together. And then maybe afterward they talk about it, you know, and that's, that's what I would like. Um, I would hope that more people speak up and say like, you know, there's a, there's a broad diversity of thought and range of opinion and, it reflect, and it's more reflective of the audience that we're serving as opposed to this, this tiny clustered minority of just, um, crazy, stupid Marxist radicals. So that's my answer. So everybody, please, a big round of applause for Clifton Duncan. Thank you, guys.